Thank you. First of all, thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Um, if you have seats next to you towards the wall, please move towards them so people who might be coming late have an easier time getting in. First, please note the location of the nearest fire exits as well. In the event of a fire alarm, please proceed calmly to the nearest exit and move away from the building. Please maintain a clear path in the aisles. Smoking is not allowed in university buildings at Brown. And please turn off and silence your cell phones and radios. Thank you. Mm -hmm. not just learn about the facts, you know, X amount of people were killed, X amount of people were rounded up in their concentration camps, which I really hear the more subjective side. Oh, there's always something else. It makes a pretty strong emotional impact when you hear people talking about their own stories. You know, you read it in, in a book and you can only imagine um, the effects of it, but when you actually see someone in person who was there, it's profoundly moving in a different way. I think learning about any trials and tribulations that a certain people go through are relevant to wildlife. I think it's relevant to everyone's life. Those are issues that apply to not just uh, Jews, but also to all humans, you know? Because we're all, we're all different, and these differences should be respected. You know, it's one of the largest lessons in all of mankind's history. I think it's one of the greatest atrocities, and we have to, if we forget about it, you know, we run the risk of repeating something similar. So. It is worth knowing about and it's worth looking at and then looking around us and saying what are things that are like this that are still happening that we're not doing anything about and that's what's really scary i think my name is ben heller and i direct the uh, hibu which is the holocaust initiative at brown university um in the history of brown holocaust survivors have not been brought to campus to give formal lectures to our students i feel like this is something that's endlessly important um, most students at Brown have a very academic understanding of the Holocaust. They read it in books, they see it in documentaries, they may even see it in movies, but they haven't experienced the actual personalized dialogue that comes with a Holocaust survivor talking to them in person. And this is our goal. We'd like to make the Holocaust real, emotional, we'd like to make people really understand what it was like for people that experienced it, and we would love to bring it beyond an academic discourse into something that is really impactful. Surviving the Unthinkable is an annual series hosted by 
by the Holocaust Initiative at Brown University, also known as HIVU. Last year, we had a presentation from my grandmother, who survived the Holocaust in Poland in a Jewish partisan group. Tonight, we are honored to be able to hear the personal stories of Mr. Al Linder, born in Romania, and Mr. Steen Metz, born in Denmark, both of whom survived different Nazi concentration camps. After their presentations, our guests will be interviewed by the chair of the Judaic Studies Department, Professor Ma Mendel, who is also a key advisor to Hebrew. Please, everybody, hold your questions. There will be time for question and answer around 6.45 towards the end of the presentation. Let's welcome our first speaker, Mr. Al Linder. I was born in a province called Bukovina. Uh, Bukovina has always been a part of some other country. It has never been a country of its own. Uh, when my grandparents and parents were born, it was part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. When I was born in 1936, it was part of Romania. Uh, after World War II, it was part of the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union broke up, they split Bukovina. The top two, uh, the northern two-thirds went to uh, Ukraine the southern third went to Romania. What I want to talk about is the background of the Jews in Bukovina and where they came from. Uh, the Jews in Bukovina really come from the Austria-Hungarian Empire culture. My grandfather, my grandparents, my parents were born when Bukovina was part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Just for your information, it's located uh, north of Romania, uh, east of Czechoslovakia and uh, Hungary, and to the north and east is uh, the Ukraine. But the culture of the Jews in Bukovina is really the Austria-Hungarian culture. Uh, the reason for that was that during my grandparents and my parents' time, uh, during the Austria-Hungarian Empire, there was a very benevolent ruler, Emperor Franz Josef, who really gave the Jews of Bukovina and uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire the opportunity for, to participate in every aspect of life of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. As a result of which, you have some unique accomplishments of the Jews of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Just to name a few, Sigmund Freud, Gustav Mahler, Albert Einstein, and Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism, as an example. Uh, the Jews in Bukovina were very secular by comparison to Jews in Poland and uh, uh, the rest of Eastern Europe. And they were also highly educated. As a result of that, the city, uh, the capital of Chernowitz, where I was born, was really a center of Jewish culture uh, in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. And, what, and if, if you walk through the city today, and this, these are pictures that I took when I went back to uh, Bukovina with my daughter 12 years ago, you can still see the remnants of Jewish culture as you walk through the streets of Chernowitz. What made Chernowitz unique for Jews was the university. The university was one of the finest universities in Southeastern Europe. And by the beginning of the Second World War, uh, when uh, the fascist government of Romania took over, over 50% of the faculty at the university was Jewish. <coughs> that influenced who the Jews of, Ch of Chernowitz and Bukovina were. They were writers poets, they were actors, they were musicians, they were in every uh, field of culture, cultural endeavorment uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the country of Romania. By 1936, when I was born, the uh, Romanian government had taken over uh, Bukovina from uh, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire disintegrated. And in the 1930s, uh, the uh, fascist party in Romania became prominent, and by 1938, 
they were elected and were in office. Uh, the Jews in Bukovina didn't feel the impact of the uh, anti-Semitism that was to come until 1940. 1940, Russia briefly took over Bukovina from Romania. And in 1941, uh, the Romanians, with the help of the uh, Germans, who, be who became allies of Romania, took back Bukovina from the Russians. And that is when our nightmare began. My parents grew up in two small villages outside of Chernovitz. And as young people, they moved to the city, met, and got married. And the Jews in Bukovina had a rather uh, idyllic life until 1941. My grandma would come to visit from the village uh, regularly and, and be with uh, us in the city. But in 1941, things changed. The uh, uh, fascist government of Romania in, uh, initiated uh, laws that were very similar to the Nuremberg laws in Germany. We had to, uh, Jews had to wear the uh, yellow star. And then in uh, July, an edict came out that uh, all Jews have to move into ghettos. Well, my maternal uh, grandparents lived in a village outside of Chernowitz. On a Friday afternoon in July of 1941, my grandfather was sitting in his two-room house. It was Friday afternoon. He was getting ready for the Sabbath. And he was sitting at the table of the kitchen, facing the front door, studying a page of Talmud, when suddenly the front door burst open and shots were fired. My grandfather was hit in the head. He immediately uh, keeled over the bo open book as if he had fallen asleep. My grandmother, who was in the back, heard the noise. She was getting ready for the Sabbath also. She ran out to see what the noise was about. And two shots rang out. And she was shot in the stomach twice. She dragged herself around for the rest of the weekend with two bullets in her stomach. My grandfather lying dead at the table. They were shot by their neighbors because there was a pogrom in the village. And during that day, 137 Jews in the village were killed by their neighbors. Uh, eventually, uh, after the Sabbath, there were a number of Jews who survived that weekend only because they were out of their homes. They were either on the road or in another place uh, doing something. And when they came back, they discovered 137 Jews dead in their homes. This is the mass grave where they are buried. Uh, among them, children, men, old people. My father's family comes from a village called Kisilov. And in Kisilov, the same thing happened. Except here, 144 Jews were killed. There is a mass grave in this field in Kisilov, for those 144. This is the monument. And not too long ago, this monument was desecrated and torn uh, down. Uh, nobody knows by whom, except there is good uh, feeling that people know who did it. In, 1940, in, in the summer of 1941, an edict came out in Chernowitz that all Jews must move into a ghetto a designated area of the city of uh, Chernowitz, six by eight blocks. There were over 70,000 Jews living in uh, Chernowitz at the time. We lived in this house, and our apartment was the ground floor apartment that you see there. Uh, we were told that every person can take one 
knapsack of whatever they wanted to take per person. In our case, it was my, my parents, my 15-month-old sister, and myself. And then we also had my father's parents uh, with us. We were moved into the six by eight block uh, ghetto, which was near the train station. And we were told when we left our apartments to leave everything there except for the knapsack or rucksack that we took with us, uh, and to leave the key on the kitchen table. So all of our belongings stayed behind in the apartment. We were moved into one of these houses these houses were emptied of all furniture, and people were moved into every room in a house. And as many people as could lie on the floor with their heads towards the wall were fit into a, a room. And we were lying like sardines in a can next to each other with our heads to, to the four walls of the room. And what you would typically have is two or three families if it was a large room. And in order to provide some semblance of privacy, we hung uh, sheets or blankets to separate one family from another family. When all of the Jews were assembled in the ghetto, over 70,000, they began to empty the ghetto out. And every few days, a train, not like this one, but a cattle car train, this is a picture that I took 12 years ago of this, of this railroad station in uh, Chernowitz. Uh, would come, and they would empty out house by house, uh, and, uh, filling up the, the train as much as they could. And they did that from July of 1941 until November of 1941. Our turn did not come until October of 1941. We were taken down to the train station. We were loaded onto a, 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 a cattle car. Uh, we were, the train took us to the end of the line, which is about halfway towards the destination where we were being taken. We had no idea where we were being taken. The rest of the way uh, was on foot for men. Women and children were taken on horse-drawn uh, Carriages, uh, wagons, sorry, not carriages, wagons. Um, my mother, my grandmother, my sister and I were on one of these wagons one day when a Romanian officer came by and he wanted to see what my mother was holding, what was in the bundle that my mother was holding. And it was my sister who was 16 months old at this point. He looked at her, he was a sophisticated, highly educated officer, and he said, what a pity, what a pity. And my mother didn't have any idea of why he said that until later on when she found out. Uh, my sister was an extraordinarily beautiful little girl, uh, but we were now in the Ukraine in November and December, which is bitter cold. And my mother, in order to feed my sister, would chew the bread that she was able to get because it was frozen and feed it to my sister. Uh, on the trip, um, the men had to be on foot. My grandfather, who was 76 years old, uh, at this point, the mud is getting up to your knees in the Ukraine. Uh, my grandfather, who was 76 years old, could not uh, walk. So my father took him in, on his back and carried him. Now, my grandfather was about six foot tall. I'll show you a picture soon of him. My father was five foot three. And he carried my grandfather on his back because if he didn't, they would shoot him. We eventually made it to the concentration camp that we would be in. 
It was in a city called, in a town called Bershaw. So let me now just very briefly tell you about the concentration camps that I'm talking about. These concentration camps were called Transnistria. Transnistria is a Romanian for on the other side of Niesta River. There were about 16 camps that were built in Transnistria. Each of the camps was built next to a major military base of the German-Romanian uh, uh, military force. And they were essentially there as slave labor to support the military camps for the Germans and the Romanians. Uh, in this hut where we were, uh, our family was to the left of the door. My grandfather was next to the door, lying on the floor, head to the wall. My grandmother was next to him, my, grand, my father, my mother, my sister, and I was at the corner of, the, uh, of, of this uh, hut. And uh, as soon as we got there, an epidemic of typhus broke out, and almost everybody became sick. Now the problem is that there was no medication, there was no food, there was not even water, as a result of which one third of the people died within the first month of typhus. This was December, the end of December, beginning of January, end of December of 41, beginning of January of 42. The first to die was my sister. My parents had typhus, and when you have typhus, you are in a delusion, you're a delusional, and you don't know what's going on. My sister's body was taken and put outside. My parents had no idea what was going on. Next to die was my grandfather and then my grandmother. And the same thing happened. Bodies are taken out. When somebody dies, they're put outside the door. Eventually, somebody comes along with a cart, carts the bodies away somewhere, which we never knew where. And I, I didn't know where until I came back there 12 years ago. Um, people then uh, recovered for a while after, after the epidemic uh, abated. About a third of the people died during the first month. And then subsequently to that, another third of the people died from hunger, disease, or were shot. The people were used for slave labor to support the military camps. Now, one of the things that um, I am amazed at is what my father did before he left. Uh, people would sew uh, valuables into the lining of coats, uh, jewelry, money, whatever. <coughs> my father did that, but he, he, he also put one other thing into the lining of his coat a glass cutter. I don't know how many of you, of you know, have ever seen a glass cutter. It's a little stick. At the end, it's a little metal holder which has a little diamond tip. And that, you use that little diamond tip to cut glass. When my father showed up for the first uh, uh, work call, uh, the uh, commander of the uh, labor unit asked is there anybody here that is a glazier? My father never in his life, I don't think, used that glass cutter. He had it as a tool. He raised his hand and he said, yes, I am one. Only because he had that tool. He then was asked to step out of the line and he was taken in, inside one of the buildings. And he became the glazier for the military compound. And he basically worked putting in windows, fixing windows during the day. On the way home, uh, back to the, the hut, he would stop on the way and, and uh, at a farm and ask the farmer if they needed any glass work done. And if they said yes, he would do the work for them. And they would pay him with uh, potatoes, bread, a chicken, or whatever, which he would bring home. And essentially, we were fed by his work after he left the, uh, the military base. Um, we saw World War II up and close. So I will tell you a couple of incidents that we observed. 
One day we heard music. It was a winter day. It was snow was up to your knees. And we hear music outside. So we went out to take a look to see where it was coming from. And we saw in the, in the distance about five or six what looked like uh, Russian soldiers, but they actually were not in uniform. Uh, they were just wearing civilian clothes, and one of them had a harmonica, an accordion, and he was playing music, and they were walking in the direction of the military camp, the German military camp. And uh, my father and I looked at each other in amazement. And it turned out that this was a reconnaissance unit that uh, went up to, uh, to see what's going on. Later in the afternoon, we heard the music again, and here they were coming back, and we were amazed that they were still alive. About two weeks later, we heard a noise. This is 1940, at the end of 43, beginning of 44. And we ran out to look, and up in the sky, we saw two planes, and they were shooting at each other. The plane in the front was shooting from the tail, and the, ta and the plane in the back was shooting from the front. The plane in the front was German, the plane in the back was Russian. Flew over our heads, and uh, we, we uh, were amazed to see what was going on. We began to think something is happening when we saw that. And a few weeks later, we heard a very funny noise outside. And when we walked out, we saw a sea of Russian soldiers walking, marching. And in front of this hut, my father and I were standing in front of it, walked a, what looked like a 10 or 12 year old. They all were wearing the long Russian military coats. He had a rifle over his shoulder. It was as big as he was. He was asleep and he was marching. When we saw that, my father decided it was time to leave, and he uh, packed us up, and we began to walk back to Chernowitz. And the idea was, we were going to walk right behind the, the, the front lines of the, of the Russian-German uh, uh, war, and if they ever counterattacked, we were dead. This is my father with his, with his parents, they both, died and are buried in the camp and mass grave. This is the mass grave <coughs> in Bersha. 6,713 Jews are buried here, including my sister and my grandparents. There is no monument. This is my daughter trying to light a candle in memory of our family. We came back in 1944 and realized there was no reason to stay. So we got up and we decided that we wanted to go somewhere where we would be safe. This is a picture that was taken by the Jewish underground of me. Uh, <coughs> in order to uh, create a false passport, false, false documents for us to uh, be taken out from behind the Iron Curtain and taken to Palestine. We made it into a, a, a uh, DP camp, a displaced person camp in Italy in November of 1945 in Cremona. And as you can see, this camp was under the jurisdiction of the British Army. You see the British officers in the back. This is all the children in the camp out of 2,600 Holocaust survivors. <coughs> Not many children survived. Uh, in order to show that you belong, we had no documentation. UNRWA, United Nations Arrangement Work Agency, gave us documentation to show who we are. Otherwise, we have no identity. <coughs> This is what people did in the DP camp. Stand on line three times a day to get a meal. You are looking at people on this line. One is a lawyer, one is a doctor, or one is a college professor. This is what people are reduced to as Holocaust survivors in the DP camp. Uh, in 1947, my mother with other people are marching in order to get a, a homeland in Palestine. And here we are in Lago de Gordo. This is Mussolini's summer home, which was made into a camp for children. And uh, we are being prepared to go to Palestine and to fight for our lives. The man that's uh, ha teaching us happens to be a Jew from Palestine who was in the British Army during the war. 
After our visit back 12 years ago, you have to go through Kiev in order to get to uh, Chernowitz. We stopped at Babi Yar. How many of you have ever heard of Babi Yar? Raise your hand. Babi Yar, well, it was a mass killing field outside of Kiev during 1941. In September 29 to September 30th of 1941, all the Jews in Kiev and surroundings were told to, uh, that they will be repatriated to a place where they will live during the war. It was behind those trees where they were told to concentrate on. When they got there, they were told to take all their valuables with them. They were stripped not only of their valuables, but of their clothes. They dug a trench 150 meters long, 50 meters wide, and 50 meters deep. And they took the Jews from behind the trees where they didn't know what was going on except they heard shots, naked, lined them up in front of the trench, and shot them. They did that for 48 hours, round the clock. In this field are 37,710 Jews buried in this mass grave in two days. My memories of the trip back are my daughter trying to light a candle in memory of her namesake, my sister. And the other is, if you walk around Babi Yar, you see monuments all around. Uh, one is from the Israeli government. The one that I remember vividly is this one. It's from the Bible. Called the Meachecha Tzorakim Elai Min Hadama. This is the most vivid description of what the Holocaust was all about. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Linder for your presentation. I'd like to invite up our second speaker, Mr. Steve Metz. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a very, very impressive uh, group in here. And I know Ben and his group work very hard on this event. And I want to applaud them for bringing awareness to Holocaust. Remembering Holocaust is very, very important. Can you hear me in the back? Thank you. These days, as I'm sure you know, there are deniers uh, all over the world. Holocaust didn't exist less than 70 years after the end of the World War. So the Holocaust survivors, uh, we're not going to be around forever. And we have to rely on you to pass on the word to your friends, your colleagues, to the next generation. We must never forget that the Holocaust existed. For that reason, as part of my memoirs, which I finished about two years ago, uh, I wrote a separate book, A Danish Boy in Theresa Stadt, Reflections and a Holocaust Survivor. Uh, this was part on my memoirs, as I said, I finished it about two years ago, and it's very, very important for me that we uh, remember forever that it happened. What I like to do, uh, and I better keep track of my time, I know Ben will, and uh, I want to share with you some of my experiences from the Holocaust. I was born and raised in Denmark. I've been in the United States for over 50 years. As far as World War II is concerned, as it relates to Denmark, it started on April the 9th, 1940. That's when the German invaded Denmark, and there was no really war. We were a very small country, and surrender right away. There was no way we could keep up with the big war machine, and there was no reason, as far as the government was concerned, to seeing a lot of casualties. 
This was despite a non-aggression pact signed by Hitler. Of course, nobody, we know now, nobody could trust him. He had signed several pacts with many other countries, and uh, it, it wasn't worth even the cost of the paper it was written on. For the first three and a half years of the occupation, life for a Jewish family like my own was very, very different than in other European countries where the land was occupied uh, by the Germans. We did not have to wear a star. Uh, I could continue to go to school, which was not a Jewish school. My father continued to work. And uh, the Danish government, to some extent, cooperated with the Germans up to a point. Uh, we had a number of agricultural products pork, cheese, eggs, and so on. We used to export them to England. During the war, they went to Germany, and we fed the army, uh, the German army in Denmark. And that was one of the reasons why we lived, and I want to emphasize, a relative uh, normal life. As normal as it can be when you have room darkness, when food and gasoline is rationed, and you see Gestapo all over in the street. But it was completely different, and I want to emphasize that, than life in other European countries uh, occupied by the Germans. Uh, we were supported by the population in Denmark. Contrary to most other countries that were occupied, there was very little anti-Semitism in Denmark. Uh, as far as the Danish population was concerned, we were no different. We were part of the society. This included the Danish king. Here's a picture of 1940, riding the horse. And I love this picture, but you can see how he's looking straight forward with the German soldiers saluting uh, him. A number of myths about the Danish king uh, I'll be more than happy to talk about them later, but uh, I don't think I have time right now. As far as the concentration, uh, as far as being arrested, uh, on October 2nd, 1943, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, Gestapo knocked on our door, and my father answered the door, and that's when we were arrested. We had 20 minutes to get ready. They encouraged my mother to pack up her jewelry, whatever, she had very little. Encouraged my father to bring money, and also my mother to bring food. Uh, I was not brought up in the Jewish faith. My father was. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know that I was different. And really, as far as I was concerned, or the Danish population, I was no different. And uh, we were part of the society, and that's the way the Danes looked at the Jewish people, which is very different to many other uh, countries. 95% of the population, of the Jewish population, or about close to 7,000, escaped. We were among the 5%. Later on, I'll be more than happy to go into detail why we were among the uh, 5%. Well, the Danish population stood behind the Jews from the king, the archbishop. They were hiding Jewish people in the churches. They were hiding Jewish people in, in the hospitals. And there are many, many stories. There are a lot more stories about how the Danish Jews escaped than the ones that went to uh, uh, concentration camp. Here's a picture of the school to my knowledge, this is the only picture uh, in existence of the arrest of the Jewish people. This was about 60 people, and uh, they were from outside of Copenhagen. After being assembled in the schoolyard, we were transported to another town, and we were herded into this boxcar. Uh, Al talked about a cattle car. I like to refer to it as a cattle car because it used to be used to transport uh, uh, cattle, but technically, I guess it's a box car. 
My father, mother, and I were among several great number of other Jewish people in the car. It was completely dark, and we had no idea where we were going. There were no bathroom facilities. We used buckets for waste. There was no food other than the food we had bought ourselves. There was a great deal of uncertainty. We had no idea where we were going. The transportation took a little over three days and three nights, making one stop on the way. And we got, would you imagine, I think we were 40 or 50 people in the car. We got two bottles of water to share. There was not enough room to even sit down for all the people there. Four children, including myself, we were lying down. The rest of the people, the adults, alternated between standing and uh, sitting down. Eventually, we arrived. Interation is about 550 miles from Ulse, and that is where we came from in Denmark. Teresen or Teresen is the Czech pronunciation of the name. In German, it's Theresenstadt. Of course, as soon as we arrived, the first thing the Germans did, got the money from my father, got whatever jewelry my mother had. I mean, this was the kind of people they were, cruel, barbaric and you certainly couldn't, uh, couldn't trust them at all. <coughs> when I make presentations to middle schools and high schools, uh, they always ask me, what was life like in Therese instead? And I like to uh, uh, discuss that or talk to that because I think you'll be interested in hearing that. First of all, uh, we all lived in barracks. The men in separate barracks, women in separate barracks, children in other barracks, and the seniors in a different barracks. That included my uh, grandmother. Uh, I was only eight years old at the time, and uh, I stayed with my mother. We, uh, that was our cold home away from home for 18 months on the love. This is an illustration, but I think it's a very good illustration. We lived in a bunk bed. We had very little belongings, and of course there was no room for any belongings. You can see some of the clothes hanging on the ladder. We slept on straw mattresses with very little straw, but lots of bed bugs and lice. Everybody worked in Teresa's staff. Uh, my father, who was an, an attorney, he was used to office work and uh, litigation in courthouses and was not used to heavy work. It was basically slave labor, slave labor construction work in the streets during the cold winter months. He had an overcoat with him from Denmark and the Gestapo came and saw it off. You don't work in an overcoat. And I also heard, I, I didn't see it myself, but he was whipped a number of times asking uh, to increase uh, productivity. And I understand some of the younger workers helped him. Not being used to that kind of work, he couldn't handle it. Uh, he uh, lost about 50% of his body weight and died after less than six months from starvation. My mother worked in a factory, worked with a mineral that you may not be familiar with, but it's called mica, and they were slicing uh, the, formica, the mica, the mineral, mineral into uh, thinner slices, and the Germans used it as war uh, insulation material uh, for the planes. One day when she was working, the Gestapo came in and asked my mother how she was, and she said, not very well. And they, they asked, why? And she answered, I lost my husband. How did you lose your husband? And she replied, telling the truth, from, uh, he, lost, uh, he died from starvation. 
Apparently, you could hear a needle drop in that room, and all her co-workers said, you, couldn't, you shouldn't say this, you could have been shot. My mother said, but that was the truth. The official death certificates for my father said pneumonia. The next eight days, the same Gestapo man came into the factory and asked the same question, and now my mother, eight days in a row, said, from pneumonia. She also worked cleaning floors, and uh, after she had cleaned the floor, there was a bucket of dirty water, and the German came in, kicked the bucket, so my mother had to clean the floor again. These were the kind of people uh, uh, that the Germans were in, in the camp. Uh, people that worked, and that was about everybody except uh, the uh, seniors, worked eight, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. That included weekends, no observation of Christian holidays or Jewish holidays. I also worked, I was a messenger. And when I talked to uh, middle schools, I know it's very difficult for them to realize that in those days, we had no cell phones, we had no computers, we had no TVs, we didn't have access to newspapers in the camp. We didn't have access to radio. The best news we got, that was uh, rumors. So I was a messenger, and uh, my job, three or four hours a day, as an eight-year-old boy, was to get, take documents from one office to the other. Today it's a lot easier You push a button and you pass on your document. My big salary for doing that job was a slice of uh, white bread uh, that, I, that I received as my reward. It was kind of interesting. I was making a presentation to a Rotary Club in Florida. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very lucky I live in Florida during the winter months. And uh, when I made the presentation to the Rotary Club, one of the person there who happens to be a minister said, and I thought that was a very profound statement, he said, now that you're talking to people, you're still a messenger. And I, I never forget the, that comment. <laughs> After six months, we started getting passes from family, from the Red Cross. Uh, unfortunately, they started shortly after when my father died. <coughs> we got food. We got, uh, in addition to food, we got vitamins. And we got clothing. Without it, it would have been very, very difficult to survive. But lo and behold, the Germans helped themselves. It was very seldom that we got the whole package, the whole parcel. One day, my mother got a very, very heavy parcel. She couldn't understand why it was so heavy. It turned out there were three bricks in the parcel, nothing else. The Germans had helped themselves to the rest. Food was used to bar bartering, and uh, I'm, I'm sure my mother was very good at it. I was growing, and I needed new shoes, and you know, that was my shoe store. You couldn't go to the shoe store. There's nowhere you could get shoes. So she bartered and got uh, a pair of shoes for me uh, for some food that let she gave some other people. I played soccer. Soccer is uh, the major sports in Europe. And uh, again, when I talk to middle school, I, I have to explain to the girls, in those days, they didn't play soccer. They, they weren't really participating in sports. And I played with a, a number of other children. That included children from Czechoslovakia. At that time, it was called Czechoslovakia. Today, it's the Czech Republic or Slovakia, or, or part of it is Slovakia. We played on the gravel field. I came home one day, and I was very sad, and I asked my mother, why were these Czech children not there? She knew exactly where they were, but she protected me, and she didn't tell me. I had no idea about transport in those days, but they were sent in transport. And uh, I didn't know about transport while I was there, 
There are things I can remember, but there are a number of things I cannot remember. I've done a lot of research uh, for my <coughs> book. I can remember things from prior to the war, and certainly also, of course, afterwards. But somehow, I may have suppressed some of it, but what happened uh, in, at the Holocaust. Uh, I want to talk about a holiday where the mothers, including mine, wanted to be very creative and treat their children. So they took slices of white bread, put sugar in it, put a little margarine with it, got hold of some wood, and were able to heat it up and made it into balls, and we would treat it to candy, probably the best food we had during those uh, 18 months. I should tell you about the food, which was very little. Uh, they uh, fed us in the morning coffee substitute with bread, if we like it, a little jam. For lunch and dinner, the favorite dish was what's called potato soup, hot water flavored with potato skin. We, uh, I didn't eat it for the first couple of days. It was just terrible. But we had to live. We, we needed to continue to live. And eventually, we, got, we had to get used to it, and we ate it. We got some bread with it. On a lucky day, we would get dumplings. But again, without the parcels, I think it would be very difficult uh, to survive. One day, towards the end of the war, when the Germans probably realized that they were losing the war, they uh, formed a human chain of children like myself. And we formed a chain, and there were urns. All the bodies were cremated. Quite frankly, there wasn't room for, for the bodies otherwise. They were cremated, put into cardboard boxes as an urn, and uh, it was our job to pass the urn from one person to the next, and eventually thrown into the river. Uh, it's hard to imagine when there were 25,000 urns in total. And the Germans were very meticulous in all record keeping, <coughs> and they had the name and the number on all the urns, and a friend of mine who was three years older was standing next to me, and I didn't hear that until later. And every time he passed an urn to me, he would turn it around so I would not see the name or the number of my father on, on the urn. On June the 23rd, 1944, the Germans made a major hoax. They invited international delegation of Red Cross people to Theresienstadt. The visit was postponed no less than three times. They wanted to make sure that it looked like they wanted it to look with uh, clean streets, flowers, new flower beds, lawns, fancy storefronts, cafes, restaurants, even banks. As a matter of fact, they imported a number of French children, Jewish children. They looked very healthy because they had just arrived. Their clothes looked very nice. It was all to show the delegation that this was a model camp. So reasons that has often been referred to as a model camp. It is a big, big misconception it was a model camp for one day and one day only. And that's when they showed Theresa's death in a completely different light than it was on an everyday uh, basis. We were even moved to nice supporters. Uh, there were a lot of, they didn't want it to look too uh, crowded. So they sent thousands of people in transport prior to the visit. And I can go on and on. Uh, unfortunate delegation believed them. Hitler and his people were successful in the propaganda. And would you believe they even made a film? And in some of the museums, you can actually see part of the films. 
and it, it's just incredible. It's very hard for me, and I'm sure I'm not sure to affect you, but to understand that uh, they didn't uh, really know what was going on. So it's on April, just a second, yeah, on April the 15th, two minutes? Okay, I better rush. <laughs> time is time is uh, time is time is flying. Uh, we were on April the fifteenth. Uh, the Red Cross came to save us, and uh, we couldn't believe it until we were on the buses. But uh, it was wonderful. It was a miracle, and with the help of the Red Cross and the diplomats, they were able to persuade the powers to be to, to save us. We were met in Denmark, we had a great welcome in Denmark. We could not stay in Denmark, but we had uh, to move on to Sweden. There was still war in, uh, in Denmark. We were quarantined for a week in Sweden and returned to Denmark on May the 5th, which was the official day for capitulation. May the 5th also happens to be my birthday, and it means they love their flag, and they use the Danish flag a lot. And of course, I think ever since then, they're flying to celebrate my birthday. <laughs> when I came back to Teresa, I went back there in year 2009 to do more research. There was a museum there. There were names and birthdays of 15,000 children on the ceiling and on the walls. And that was very, very very, very moving. And coming back to Denmark, since then, uh, I lived a normal life. Country to other countries, we were welcomed with open arms when we came back to Denmark. And uh, I spent a number of years there. I went back to school. And eventually, I came to the United States in 1962. And I spent my uh, entire career in the food business. And maybe subconsciously, I wanted to make sure that I would have enough food to eat for the rest of my life. And I think time is up. Uh, is that right? I could probably go on and check it out. But thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 
Um, I come from a, a, a fairly religious family. Um, the reason my parents survived, I believe, is because they did have faith that they would be saved, God would save them. Um, every Friday night, my mother would make believe that she's lighting candles. And she would put her arms around me with my head and her stomach. And she, I would hear her say a prayer. And the prayer that she kept repeating every Friday night and that I heard with her arms around me was, God, help us to get out of this terrible situation. God, bring us out of this terrible situation. <clears throat> And uh, I remember that more than anything else. It's Friday night, my mother making believe she's lighting candles and, pray and saying prayers. Um, I, wa I want to tell you right now something that I didn't have a chance to talk about before. Who died? The people who died in the camp where I was especially uh, in the early part, were the intellectuals, the highly educated, uh, and why did they die? Because they could not understand intellectually what was happening to them and why, and they lost all will to live. Who survived? The people who were used to working hard, plumbers, uh, People who had survival skills and or who had a belief, like my parents did, that God was there and will save them. The people who died like flies at the beginning were all the intellectuals, the highly educated, because they absolutely could not rationalize what was happening to them. This was totally, uh, uh, they gave up on life because they couldn't explain it. <coughs> My, my case is probably a, a little different. Uh, I was very being protected by my mother. She was 38 years old when, when my father died. She was very protective of me while I was there. She was very protective of me when I got back. And uh, uh, as far as the comment Al just made, uh, I often wonder if my father had not been an attorney, uh, he, he might very well have uh, survived. He had a brother in the same camp, and that brother was an architect, so he became a carpenter down there. And for my father, uh, you know, he, he just couldn't handle the job. I read a number of books about other survivors. Uh, one survivor from Poland, he was in 10 or 11 different camps, and he had a little background as, uh, as a plumber, very little. And as soon as they got to the camp, they would ask, any plumbers? He would raise his arm. Any carpenters? He would raise his arm. Any electricians? He would raise his arm. <laughs> and uh, that's, how he, uh, that's how he survived. And you had mentioned earlier that um, that you didn't know you were Jewish before you, uh, so you have very different experiences in this regard before you were arrested for being Jewish. Uh, how did your parents explain that to you? Do you remember what they said? I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't remember, but I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't, as I said, I think I mentioned, I, I, I couldn't understand it because Denmark is very, very unique, and I think I mentioned that the Jews were part of the society there. And what I probably did, didn't mention was, at that time there was a population of four and a half million, there were only 7,000 Jewish people, so that's a small fraction of the 1%. So, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I, cannot, I cannot remember that, but I, I could never understand why we were suddenly, uh, why we were suddenly uh, arrested. And I, was, I didn't realize why, how they knew where to go. And it was actually a German family that lived below us. And I thought they were the informer. It turned out the Germans didn't need any informers. They helped themselves to the complete address 
stole it from the headquarters at the synagogue there in Copenhagen. Um, well, that brings me to another question that I wanted to ask, which is um, what your encounters were like with um, non-Jews uh, during this experience. And you both you spoke, obviously, of very brutal treatment at the hands of um, Germans in the camp. Um, you didn't speak as much, Mr. Lindner, about the non-Jews uh, that you were uh, confronted by in this process. And I guess I'm wondering, I, get, I'm, I have many questions around this, but one of the questions I have is, do you, did either of you receive any kindness from anybody? In other words, was anybody able to see beyond the bigotry and the racism of the moment to reach out a hand to you at any point in this process? So that's one question. And then I have another question about um, the anti-Semitism you confronted. But maybe first, if you could tell us if there was anybody uh, who wasn't Jewish who was ever able or willing to reach out a hand to help you. If you're talking about, I assume you're talking about in the concentration camp? Or before, well, I know up until the point you were arrested, you weren't being persecuted. No, it, so. in the concentration camp, no, I didn't have any encounter with that. As far as I personally was concerned, uh, I was not abused, but obviously uh, my, my father was abused, my mother was at least verbally abused uh, prior uh, to, the, to the war. I only had good experiences with uh, non-Jewish uh, non people. Uh, and afterwards. Yeah. And afterwards, which is quite different, I understand. And Al and I just met tonight, which is very, very different. I mean, we were welcomed with open arms when we came back. A teacher took me under her arms, and uh, I went to her house, and she helped me with uh, my schoolwork. There was no official schools allowed in the camp, and uh, there was some unofficial, but very little, and she helped me, and I was able to get back to my old uh, old class, and uh, I didn't realize at the time, but she was probably testing me uh, at, at the same time, but uh, I couldn't mention one negative word about uh, how I was treated by non-Jewish people after the war, the situation in Denmark today is a completely different story, <coughs> but that's maybe a story for another time. Can you tell me a little about that? Well, in, in our camp, I uh, was surrounded by barbed wire. And uh, I knew uh, as a child that I was not allowed to go beyond the uh, barbed wire. Um, so I never had any contact with anybody outside of the barbed wire. Uh, the only time I went out of the barbed wire was in the spring and summer. I sneaked under the wire to go into a field and uh, steal radish or scallion or something and bring it back to my mother. Uh, but I never encountered anybody uh, outside the camp during the, the war. And so, um, and during the war itself, were you, what did you do during the days yourself? I basically hung around uh, the house. Uh, I had nothing to do. Um, uh, <coughs> there, there, there were very few children left alive, uh, so I had no one to play with. Um, basically nothing. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned in your talk about the pogrom in your grandparents' town. I don't know how much, of that, at that age, you must have known very little about what was going on. But I, in retrospect, it sounds like you learned quite a bit. Um, do you know to the, what kind of relationship they had with their neighbors prior to the outcome of this shocking violence? They thought they had a good relationship, which is why it was so shocking for my parents to find, find out what happened, for example, to my mother's uh, parents. Uh, we used to come and visit my uh, uh, mother's parents in the village on a regular basis. We would bring candy and things like that from the city. Uh, my grandmother, uh, whenever we did that, would run out and give the, away the candy to the children of the neighbors, either because they were sick or they needed something. Um, so for the neighbors to have done to my grandparents what they did um, was shocking to my parents. And in retrospect, when I think about it, 
but on the other hand, um, I wouldn't exactly be surprised. Uh, let me tell you why. Uh, the part of the Bukovina that we lived in was Ukraine, Ukrainian. Uh, unfortunately, there's a great deal of anti-Semitism in Ukrainian history to this day. So, did your grandparents talk about that kind of hostility to them before the war and to, uh, before the pogrom? No, no. Okay. no. Uh, th that hostility uh, uh, was there all the time, but it was con under control. <coughs> Only when that hostility was allowed to get loose when the fascist uh, government of Romania took over and essentially declared uh, free reign, you, you can go do what you want, that's when the pogroms occurred in the villages. I mean, it occurred in both villages, both my, my mother's vi village and my father's village. And the same thing happened in both, both places. I will tell you one thing about Kisilov, which is the village where my parents, come, my father comes from. Um, when Chernobyl happened, there was one place in Bukovina where the, the atomic cloud came over, and that was in Kisilov. <coughs> the population of Kisilov, the Christian population of Kisilov, was convinced that the reason they got the, the cloud from uh, Chernobyl was because what they did to their Jewish uh, neighbors. Uh, I found this out when I went back 12 years ago from the wife of the mayor of the village. Only two years ago, somebody decided to destroy that monument in Kisilov. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, your Jewish experiences, um, you come from very different backgrounds Jewishly. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the impact uh, after the war uh, of this experience on your family's Jewish identity or your personal Jewish identity as you have uh, come to terms with it. Did it, for example, in your case, did you go back to, did your, did your family change its practices and its thinking about its Jewish identity? I know I, I studied post-war France, a lot of my work has been on Holocaust survivors in post-war France, and there were some people who um, went back, who came home after the war and became much more connected, if not religiously, than um, personally at a kind of a cultural level, whereas there were others who changed their name and didn't want anything to do with this history afterwards. So I'm wondering, in both of your cases. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, address that. I, I want to repeat that, that I was not brought up in the Jewish faith. Neither was my mother. My father was brought up in the Jewish faith. If my father had survived the war, uh, I know I would have been brought up in the Jewish faith. I would have been and brought up in the Jewish faith. Uh, my mother was not, and since obviously she was a major influence on me, I, I was not brought up in the Jewish faith. Uh, the best way I can probably describe it and it's, it's a very good question. It's a question I've been uh, asked uh, a number of times. The best way I can probably describe myself is that I'm, I'm unaffiliated today. Uh, I married, my wife is from England, she's Christian. My, uh, we have two daughters. They were brought up in the Christian faith, and this is something my my uh, wife and I agreed on uh, before before we got uh, married. And uh, as a matter of fact, both daughters met uh, Catholics, and today two of my grandchildren they go to uh, they go to Catholic school. So my situation is probably quite different. Although I have made other people survivors, and including hidden children, and. They are in a separate, similar situation. But I recognize that my uh, situation is, is quite unique, but influenced by, from my mother. And she was very bitter for a number of years and so on. We had, uh, we had suffered enough. And uh, when I came to Chicago many years ago, and when I saw there was still anti-Semitism there, and there was one golf club for Christians and one golf club for, for Jewish people. It's still happening, and unfortunately, that's the way the, the world is. And we still haven't learned 
uh, from what happened during the Holocaust, based on look what happened in Cambodia and Syria and so on. We, we have a lot to learn, and this is why we have to rely on the people in this audience to pass on the message. Um, my experience is quite different. Um, uh, my parents come from a very Jewish home, and I grew up very Jewishly. Uh, when I came to this country in 1949, uh, I went to Yeshiva High School, and um, uh, my sense of identity, uh, if anything, has grown much stronger uh, as a Jew. Um, and I have a very, very strong belief that uh, the survival of the Jewish people is essential. And I have a great deal of concern about what I see going on in the world today as a result of that. Thank you. Do we have time for five minutes? Five minutes, OK. Um, so um, I have another question. I'm trying to think about how to frame this exactly. Um, it, it builds a little from Al's point about uh, who survived. Um, here I'm focused less on intellectuals versus laborers, for example. And I'm interested in a little bit in the question of resilience more generally. Um, you both strike me as men who have had pretty good lives after this experience. You have survived both literally, physically, but also um, maybe more than that. In other words, you seem like very resilient men who have who feel that there is uh, a duty in sharing your story for the future, um, but also who uh, who may have come out of this experience somewhat strengthened in some ways in, in how you um, face the challenges of the life before you. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you feel this experience formed you in your later lives. I don't know you very well, so I, my, my, um, my two minute take may not be accurate, but it, it feels very, you feel, I, it seems to me that your experience has something, has informed your later life, and I'm wondering if you could talk uh, about I, that. I'd like very much to, to address that. Uh, first of all, I was very lucky. I'm very lucky to be here. And I'm convinced that somebody was looking over my mother and myself and the other survivors. And that's one of the reasons we're here today. Uh, one question I got from a middle schooler was, do you feel guilty? Or do you feel lucky being here today? Which I thought was a pretty profound question from a middle schooler. <laughs> and uh, my answer was, maybe I should feel guilty, but I don't. But I feel very, very lucky. Uh, I think resilience has something to do with it. Uh, it certainly fits the profile of my mother, and I haven't heard to that. But luck probably has a lot more uh, to do with it, to be perfectly honest. But I was lucky because I, I lived a, a very good life. And uh, many other survivors uh, have suffered from nightmares. They still suffer from nightmares. Uh, I don't. And it helped me a great deal getting closer, uh, not only writing my book, but also going to schools and being here today to, to talk about it. So I've been strengthened by it, and my major mission, and I can't remember if I talked about it, that is to talk to students like yourself and other people, because that's my way of giving back. And uh, I've, I've done quite a bit of it the last couple of months, and, and I, want to I want to continue to doing that. Thank you. I hope that answers. Yes, thank you so much. It definitely does uh, affect you in a way where uh, it gives you uh, survival skills that uh, probably the average individual didn't have. Um, I felt very obligated throughout my life to do well in school, in every endeavor that I had. Um, I uh, happened to be very uh, committed, hardworking, uh, paranoid, uh, almost, uh, about everything. And um, I'm sure that, that that's the effect it has on you. Uh. Thank you. 
Um, so maybe I could open the floor now to questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to take the role here of calling on people. So if you could raise your hands high in the air because it's a really crowded room uh, so that I can let people, some people are stepping out, so I'm just going to let folks who have to go go because it's going to be kind of disruptive. So just hold on one second. If you could just introduce yourself. Um, my name is Stephen Grante. Thank you. And uh, I had a question for uh, private gentleman. First of all, I want to thank you both uh, you know, for speaking tonight. And my question is it's kind of two part. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion on uh, the concept or the idea that this uh, occurrence, uh, this horrible occurrence, was not specifically uh, German or European, or you could perhaps put it on any nationality or geographic people or race, but more so uh, that of a government going berserk, so to speak, and, um, and it, what are your feelings on the, the possibility of this happening to, to any government that is not monitored? Or what, um, the second part of my question is, what sort of diligence or, or vigilance do you think, as citizens of any country, that we can exercise to ensure that um, you know a government, say by the idea that all absolute power corrupts absolutely, what can we do, and particularly this the, the newer generation that's coming up, a lot of the people here that are members of that. What can we do to to prevent something like this ever happening again? Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to start. Uh, unfortunately, we have, we have not uh, we have not learned from the Holocaust. Look at what's happening in Syria. Look at Bosnia, Rwanda. It's happening in many many places. And one phrase that I use. When you're in the real estate business, you talk about location, location, location. When you're a Holocaust survivor, as far as I'm concerned, it's education, education, and education. And the people that have shown interest are the people that have shown up tonight. And we all need to do our darndest to, uh, be, be, as far as I'm concerned, treat other people the way we want to be treated ourselves, not the way we were treated during the Holocaust. Be kind to other people, show tolerance. But it's very, very sad that we have not learned from it. And I, I, I really don't know uh, what, what the answer is, but it, it's, it's going on all over the place. And now in Denmark, where uh, the Jewish population was treated very well, today, Jewish people in Copenhagen is being harassed primarily by Muslims. Denmark like Muslims in they had a very liberal uh, immigration bill. They've been har harassed and attacked to this extent that the Danish government and the chief rabbi who happens to be married to my cousin has told the Jewish people in Copenhagen, don't walk around with your kippah, don't wear jewelry. In other words, don't walk around looking like a Jewish person, and that is very, very sad, and it's happening, I know, in Sweden also, and other places, and it's a very, very sad situation. Uh, let me answer your question directly. You don't understand what it is like to be in a situation <coughs> of living under Nazi occupation. <laughs> if you don't understand what it's like to be a citizen of Nazi Germany, there is no opportunity for a citizen of Nazi Germany where the Nazis are running the country <coughs> to object to anything. You, are, you, have an, a, a, you have an image in your mind of a country that's democratic, where the people have a say, where the, people, the, the government is elected by the people, you, don't, you can't understand what it is like to be a German citizen in Nazi Germany. D can you imagine what it's like to be a, a citizen, a, 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 a German citizen in Nazi Germany? My point is the Nazi party was elected 
right. through elections. And my point is, it, can you not foresee that it's happening almost anywhere if we do not guard against it? And, and what means would you suggest um, to do so? Frankly, I am very skeptical that I know how to, how to uh, answer your question to prevent it. Uh, and let me tell you why I say that. As Dean uh, indicated, it is happening again in Europe today. It is happening in countries that you would not have dreamed possible. The Nordic countries, democratic countries. Why is it happening there? Explain to me why today, 2013, in democratic Nordic socialist countries, anti-Semitism is raging. Why? Is it because the left has decided that suddenly, in order to be a leftist, it is now okay to be an anti-Semite again? <laughs> to prove you're liberal, to prove the fact that you are a modern human being, it is okay to be an anti-Semite again? This is a tough question. You're asking an impossible question to answer. Because if you can't explain to me why it's happening in the Nordic countries today, then you don't have hope of having an answer to your question. I'm sorry to tell you that. Let me uh, turn the floor now to another question. Is there anybody else who has a question? There's a young woman over here, brown sweatshirt. Hi, uh, my name is Sophia Staley. I'm a junior here, and I'm actually majoring in German studies. And my question is, I know you were very young going through this, so you might not have been aware of it, or it might have been kept from you. But looking back, or um, having your parents or your mother tell you, were there any acts of resistance um, among the Jews, like in the ghettos or in the concentration camps that you were there? Um, yeah, any acts of resistance or defiance trying to subvert the government from what they were doing to you. Any memories, viewers? To my knowledge, there was none in Theresa. And uh, Theresa said, you know, how could we with dogs all over and Gestapo? I mean, it, it was impossible. One of the major uprisings that I'm aware of happened in uh, Warsaw. And there was an uprising in Warsaw. And I understand the Germans expected uh, to put it down in three days, and it took over a month to put down that uprising. If there are other major uprisings, I'm not aware of it. And they were so overpowering uh, that it was basically uh, nothing you could do. You didn't dare. I mean, you risked your, you risked your life. Uh, no, I have not seen any of this, so uh, I can't uh, answer that question. But I do want to tell you one experience that I had, which basically goes to the fundamental question that you asked. What does it take to be a human being? That's really the question that you asked. On the way back from the camp, we were on foot. And one day, a, uh, a Jewish family who could afford a horse and wagon passed by, saw me and my parents walking dirty and so on, and uh, uh, asked us to come on the wagon, and, uh, and we did. And as we were riding along, suddenly we see through the cover, open uh, uh, wagon, a sea of people walking. And it turns out these are German prisoners of war. As they come closer, you see their uniforms dirty you torn, they're unshaven, filthy, hungry. They run uh, 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 to uh, take a corn out of the cornfield every few minutes and eat a raw corn. Suddenly, my mother in the wagon bends down and takes out a bread from a uh, uh, knapsack that she had and is about to throw the bread out towards the, uh, by the way, the German prisoners of war are being guarded by a Russian soldier with a machine gun across his chest every 10 feet. Um, she bends down and she picks up the bread and she's about to throw it out of the wagon when my father hit her on the arm 
and uh, knocked the bread out of her arm, her hand, and said, what are you doing? She said, I was going to throw it to them because they look so in need. And my father said to her, do you know what would have happened if this bread came out of the wagon? The nearest machine gun would have raked this uh, wagon and we would all be dead. And my father turned to her and said, why in the world did you do that? And she said, they're human beings. They're God's children. And it hurt me to see that. This is my mother, whose 18-month-old daughter died in the concentration camp, whose parents were shot. She wanted to do that. I can't for the life of me now believe why in the world she would do that to this day. But it basically goes to your question. What is the fundamental character of a human being? And my mother is still alive at 105. <laughs> question about resistance, there are some scholars who've worked on this question and we've argued that the acts of your mother pray, praying in a situation where that was actually forbidden, and even of yourself, of escaping out of the barbed wire to get radishes and scallions for your family, were should be understood as individual acts of resistance, precisely because the goal of the camps was to wear people down and kill them, both in their spirit and in their uh, uh, through starvation, and so that these small acts, small individual acts that actually, I mean, as a child you may not have been thinking, I'm risking my life to do this, but you actually were, and that those should be understood as uh, acts of resistance. Another question, please. Uh, the mic is coming in here, so. <coughs> Could you, could you put the mic in your mouth, thank you. Um, because my family comes from the same towns as yours, which is Boca Vena and Chernovitz, and uh, um, what was the other town, um, Vajna. Uh -huh. And uh, what I was hearing from my parents' stories that when my mother was in the Franz Nistar camp, they actually did not allow children to be in the camps. And when I heard from you being there, it was quite surprising because she told me that the Gestapo would come and make a tour in the rooms where they were sitting, lots of women in that one room. And they hid them under the mattress, which was a store mattress, and they sat on top of her, so the Gestapo would not pick her up and send her to some places. And I never got the answer for that. And I wonder if you can enlighten me about it. Uh, th there was no such uh, restriction in, in Bershak, where I was. She was in Transnistria. Well, uh, Transnistria is an area that had 16 camps. One of the camps was Berchak, where I was. Okay. There were 15 others. Uh, Mogilov was a very famous uh, uh, camp in the Transnistria. In the, in the camp that I was in, there were, I, I, I'm not aware of any restriction like that for children. Uh, do you know the camp that your mother? Or? I don't have the name of that particular camp. My father was in Oh. And, I, and I saw something which I was astonished when I saw the, his name on one of the, um, um, what do you call it, the stones, which was the Postak family, which this is my father's family. In Kisilev? Yes, and I never saw that before. So my next question would be, how can I obtain that talent or that this? That's right. Um, I, I, ha I have that. I, I'll tell you that, that that monument was desecrated, torn apart uh, two years ago. Uh, the, the monument was put up by a, a lady from Canada. It's my, and I know where it is. It's the federal family who the daughter went down there and she put up that monument. Right. Uh, I, I've spoken right. to her. Right. Uh, I never knew this. But, but that monument was to, uh, torn down. If you give me your email address or something, I can email you the, uh, that I'd picture. I'd love it. I'd love to be more in contact with you about it. Thank sure. you so much. You invited me tonight. Are there other questions? Yes, please. Uh, we'll work our way back. So we uh, red-headed young woman here. Most of anti-Semitism has spread throughout Europe. I was wondering what, or any memory you 
I could say uh, address that. Uh, maybe I, I didn't address it uh, earlier as much as I should, but uh, Denmark was very, very unique. First of all, there are very few Jewish people uh, in Denmark, and uh, we were treated completely different than other Jewish people in uh, the occupied countries. Uh, the Germans didn't want any major uprising. Uh, they wanted to try and keep peace with the Danish government. At the end, at the fall of uh, 43, uh, the government resigned. They had too much pressure from the Germans. The Germans wanted, there was a lot of sabotage stand, uh, starting in Denmark underground, and they wanted that stuff, and they wanted the Danish government uh, to uh, hang or put, uh, any people that were caught in that, and there were a number of other things they put pressure on. But Denmark was very, very unique, and uh, there was much more anti-Semitism in Poland and, and, and in, in, the, in the Netherlands. So I think we were probably uh, the, the exception, as far as I know, and based on the research I have done. I hope that answers your question. That is a very uh, troubling question you asked. Because a year before uh, the Romanians came back, and uh, implemented the uh, Nuremberg Laws in Bukovina. Uh, my father had asked my grandfather, uh, based upon what he heard about what's going on in Germany with the Nazis, whether it wouldn't be a good idea perhaps for us to leave. And my grandfather, who grew up in the Austria-Hungarian Empire, turned to my father and said, Wir sind ein Volk das Hochkultur. They are a people of high culture. They would never allow this madman, Hitler, to do anything to us. Now, how, how, how much can you be fooled? Uh, and then I remember watching my grandfather lying there in stupor or, uh, 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 in the camp, watching his 80-month-old granddaughter's body being taken out. And I'm thinking to myself, what was going through his mind when he saw that? This is somebody who had faith in the high culture of the German people, the Hochkultur des Deutsche Volk. That is a pathetic picture to see. Unfortunately, I saw it. Uh, other questions? I believe there was, yeah, there was a gentleman here in the middle. question is very particular to the kinds of places people were stayed, so lots of camps didn't have intermingling of populations, so we can ask if that was the and, case. Uh, it's a racist that, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure that's right, there were only Jewish people there, there were no homosexuals. But I'm glad you're bringing it up because we always talk about Jewish people in, in the Holocaust, but sometimes people forget that, that they were not the only ones that hit the pursuit, homosexuals, Gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, and, and several others. But to my knowledge, uh, there were none in, in my camp. And as far as my childhood is concerned, prior, I think that was the question you asked, prior to the arrest, there were very few Jewish children where I was. 
and I, I would just play with any children. Of course, at that time, I didn't know I, I was Jewish and had no experience at that time with gypsies or, or, or homosexuals uh, I, prior, prior to the war. I have, I have no experience at all in that regard. There's a question uh, in the back of the room. <laughs> So obviously you and your families have been through so much in the camps. So I just want to know if you and your families had any like bitterness or resentment coming out and how if that's the case, how you parents are able to move on or get <coughs> such experience. Basically, how do you move on from something so terrible? How do you like move on through life and gain your faith in humanity back? The only way to do it is not to think about it. Um, my parents and, and I basically uh, try to uh, put it out of our minds. Uh, we try to go on with our lives. Uh, my, my parents uh, went to work for a living. They worked in, uh, in uh, cloth clothing factories in New York. Um, and I tried to go on with my uh, education. Uh, and I tried not to think about it or talk about it until much later. I didn't talk about it to my family. I didn't talk about it to my children. Um, and in fact, I didn't deal with this until I was asked about eight years ago to tell my story at the Yom HaShoah uh, commemoration in, in our town, and that's when I put together this uh, slide presentation. Um, and uh, only since I did that have I started, have I paid attention, and I'm now consumed by reading about anti-Semitism. The headline today in all the Israeli newspapers, which I looked at on the, on the website, because today is uh, Yom HaShoah in, in Israel. The headlines in all the papers in Israel is the report that anti-Semitic acts are up 30% in Europe in last year, 2012. That's, they do a study every year to see what happened. It is up 20% in Europe and around the world in 2012. Now that is a devastating piece of news to read. It's very interesting what uh, Al talked about because that's very typical for survivors. And I think it's hard for everybody to understand that. But my mother and I didn't talk much about it, very, very little. She did a survey for the Danish government in 1946. I had no idea it existed. I happened to get hold of it after she died. Uh, it was typical in all survivor families, they didn't talk about it. You will never forget what happened, but you try to move on. And uh, with my own family, I talk very little to my daughters about it until I wrote my book, my memoirs. And as I said, this book was part of my memoirs. And they actually learned something new. Uh, a lot of new stuff in the book, and it's it's very very typical. But it's very sad with uh, with all the anti-Semitism. But just today, I don't know if you realize that, but our public TV in Florida, in Fort Myers, and I'm sure it's the same here, they had three programs on today about the Holocaust. Two this afternoon. My wife is taping it for me. Tonight at 10 o'clock, something from Teresa said, a, re a requiem. And it's programs like that, it's people coming together. Hopefully, this will make an impact that will have a, uh, that will have a better world out there. And uh, just like Al, the last year and a half after I finished my book, this is a major mission of mine. And through the Holocaust Museum in Skokie, Illinois, where I am on the summer, and neighbors in the Florida. They know 
I would like to make a presentation every day, but at least my goal is to make one uh, every week. And I just hope that every time we talk to people, that they will multiply it because that, has, that compound has a tremendous effect. Thank you. Are there any questions from this side of the room? Just ignoring. <laughs> if not, I'll go back to this side. <laughs> okay, there's a question then over that corner over here. Uh, ghettos, 
in order to uh, deport them to concentration camps. So not much difference. Uh, we uh, lived in a, in, a, in a neighborhood that was not too kind to Jews. Are there additional questions? Okay, then I would like to thank our guests and everybody for coming. Thank you.